All right. In this segment, I want to spend a little more time talking about the nucleus of the cell and the role that it plays and also about just a, a brief introduction and talk about DNA and what we use it for because I'm going to use that to lead into the next talk, uh, mitosis and the cell cycle. So on that note, let's uh, get rolling. All right, so the nucleus. Um, remember that the nucleus is the, you know, one, it's the largest organelle within a cell, and it is also considered the control center for the cell. So remember, you know, if we have a cell, you know, you got your plasma membrane, and then, you know, you've got a nucleus, and then you've got all, you know, your other organelles are around the nucleus in one form or another, whether it's, you know, the endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, and so on. All right. And we call it the control center for the cell because that's where you find DNA, okay? In, in human cells, DNA is located within the nucleus of a cell. And that's a big difference between eukaryotic um, complex animal cells versus prokaryotic simple cells like bacterium and so on is storing DNA within the nucleus itself. All right, and we call it the control center because, as member from the previous talk, when I discussed the organelles of the cell and the old, just the basic functions of the cell, remember we said realistically the main, the, the, the biggest job that cells do are you know produce proteins. Okay, cells are essentially protein factories. That's what the bulk of the machinery of the cell is used for. Because you remember. If you go back and review, so you've got the nucleus that contains DNA, and then you've got the endo, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, you know, that's used to synthesize, you know, uh, proteins to be excreted out of the cell. You've got a Golgi complex that packages and modifies proteins to be exported out of the cell. All right, you've got ribosomes you know, within the systole of the cell. Remember, the systole is basically the non-living components of the cell, the water, all right? And there are these ribosomes that synthesize proteins that are to be used within the cell itself, all right? You've got mitochondrion, all right? The mitochondrion generate, you know, the bulk of the ATP, you know, the, the energy that the cell uses, and a lot of, you know, the bulk of that ATP is going towards protein synthesis. Because remember, the average protein is 25 to 50,000 amino acids, all right, in, you know, in uh, composition. So, and remember, we have to burn one ATP, you know, per one amino acid. All right, so we're burning, you know, if we're making one protein alone, we could be expending up to 50,000 molecules of ATP. That's a lot of energy. And, you know, obviously cells are cranking out more than that on a day-to-day -day basis. So the bulk of the, of the functional organelles of the cell go towards this protein synthesis process. All right, and remember there's other organelles like the cytoskeleton for shape, motility, um, you know, support for the cell. There are those spindles that we talked about that are used for, that are, you know, primarily used for mitosis. There's a smooth endoplasmic reticulum that can be used for a variety of functions depending on the cell you're talking about. Then you've got lysosomes and peroxisomes used to basically clean out or digest, you know, clean out the cell, digest old worn out parts. Phagocytes use those to um, digest whatever they phagocytize or eat and so on, okay? But the but as mentioned before, you know, the main machinery is used for protein synthesis, okay? So that's why we say the nucleus is the control center because, the you know, depending on, um, I'll talk more in detail about DNA in a second, but, you know, we can drive, the, the nucleus can drive the synthesis of many, 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 many different proteins, all right? So here, we can kind of uh, get a look at the general representation of the nucleus, and this image is coming again from Mary Evan Hoag's 10th edition. Um, you know, we can kind of get a general idea of what the nucleus looks like. Now, again, bear in mind that the nucleus, I actually kind of like this image right here because you notice the nucleus is not directly in the center of the cell. Remember that fluid mosaic model that we've been, you know, talking about the whole time, that, that cells have very dynamic structures, all right, that, that all these organelles and, and parts and, and the proteins are suspended within water, so the cell is always fluctuating and moving around, okay, but 
so like I said, the nucleus is not always dead center in the cell like you see in the pictures. All right. Then as mentioned, as you can see, and, you know, another cool thing about this picture is you can kind of, even though the nucleus is highlighted, you can see all the other organelles. This is by far the largest organelle within the cell. All right. And then if we look at the different parts of the of the nucleus, you can see that there's an outer membrane that there and that this this outer covering, this outer membrane is what we would call the nuclear envelope. Okay, so we've got a nuclear envelope, and then you can see that there are pores that span the membrane, the outer and inner membrane of the nucleus, and we would call these nuclear pores. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about these. You know, we have to talk a little bit before we get into DNA. There's one thing I, I want to mention about DNA. All right, so you've got this dark inner area of the nucleus. Um, Excuse me. You know, this all of this you see in here, this kind of nucleoplasm, all right, that's where you find all the DNA within the, you know, not all, but the, the bulk of DNA, all right? Now, one thing to remember about DNA is that DNA does not escape the nucleus of the cell. It's not supposed to, all right? So basically, but as mentioned before, all the protein-making machinery of the cell is found outside of the nucleus, all right? So... DNA does drive and command the activity of the cell, the protein-making activity of the cell, but it does this by sending messages out of the nucleus to the machinery, okay? And, and those messages are in the form of RNA, more specifically, messenger RNA, all right? And I'll talk more about how we develop, how we create messenger RNA in a, in a bit. So keep that in mind. Nucle DNA does not escape the nucleus of the cell. It sends messenger RNA out of, this, out of the nucleus so it can communicate with these ribosomes to drive protein synthesis, all right? So you've got this nuclear envelope, the nuclear pores, this inner nucleoplasm, and then these very dark areas. Nu uh, nucleus tends to have one or more of these very dark areas called the nucleolus, okay? And basically, this is just an area of proteins and nucleic acids that are used to drive the production of what's called rRNA or ribosomal RNA, okay? And we'll talk more about the ribosome in a little bit, but, you know, this plays an integral role in the function of the ribosome and protein synthesis as well, all right? And then the reason why you see the rough endoplasmic reticulum in this picture here, remember that all the rough endoplasmic reticulum is, it's just an outgrowth of the nuclear envelope, okay? So, so the nuclear envelope extends out into the cytoplasm of the cell, and basically as it, as it grows out, notice how it kind of, the envelope folds inward on itself, and, you know, this is just a safe space, all right? And then there are ribosomes that are attached to the nuclear envelope, and those are sites for protein synthesis. So it makes sense then. So you can see here that, you know, by having this rough endoplasmic reticulum, you know, basically an outgrowth of the, of the nuclear envelope here, you know, a lot of this messenger RNA does not have to go very far, you know, so we can crank out a protein. All right, so this is the basic structure of the nucleus. Now let's talk um, a little more about DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. All right, so DNA has, really has one major function. It's a code for protein synthesis, all right? DNA is a code to synthesize proteins, all right? And basically when we want to talk about you know so dna in general is a code for protein but you know that there are many 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 i mean different kinds of proteins out there i mean out of, out of the organic molecules that we discussed in the chapter two topics the basic uh, chemistry of, the, of life you know proteins are by far the most diverse molecule that you know within us all right and basically that's as a result of genes okay and genes, basically, what it so DNA is a, is a just ge a general code for protein. What a gene is, it's a specific region. Okay, so let's say this is a double-stranded area. Uh, let's say this is a strand of DNA. All right, and let's say if we take a look at this strand of DNA, there's a little region right there. Okay, let's say that's a little region right there. We would say this is a gene. Okay, and let's say this gene is a code for 
I don't know, a code to make a specific antibody. All right. And then we could go down the strand of DNA and we could isolate another gene, you know, another specific region of a strand of DNA. All right. And we could say that that's a code to make, I don't know, let's say proteins for eye color and so on. Okay, so DNA in general is a code for making proteins. What genes are, they're regions on, on a strand of DNA that are specific codes for specific proteins. And I'll talk more about the chemical structure of DNA in a second and how we make proteins, but that's, you know, that's what genes are. That's the difference between gene and just a general strand of DNA. All right, and what an allele is, it's a variation of a gene. All right, you know, I mean, we're studying human anatomy and physiology, all right? You know, you can, you know, you can take a look around. I mean, if you're in a classroom, you're walking around on the streets, you go to the grocery store. I mean, you look around that grocery store, there's a lot of different looking people around, okay? In terms of skin color, hair color, eye color, body height, body composition. I mean, we could sit here all day and list you know, various characteristics that you, that you physically see on people. All right. Those, you know, that's what we would call a phenotype. All right. So for example, um, so let's say you go into that supermarket and you see there are, um, you know, there's people with darker tones of skin. There's people with lighter tones of skin or now let's not go with skin. Let's go with eye color. Okay, let, you know, you can see that there are people with blue eyes. There are people with black eyes. You might see some people with green eyes. All right, maybe there's hazel. All right, there's brown. I mean, we could, you know, and so on. Okay, so now you know that there is a gene for eye color. Okay, but there are different variations of that gene. Okay, and as a result, you know, because of these very different variations, okay, we see different eye colors out there, even though we're the exact same organisms. All right, so that's what alleles are. They're just variations of genes that give us some diversity. All right, and I mean, these alleles are important based on, you know, obviously your geographic location. I mean, for example, people who have, you know, darker eye color and darker skin, that's necessary because these are people that are either directly from or descendants of folks from around uh, parts of the world that are that are around to or close to the equator where there's the most direct contact with sunlight all right so they have evolved to the point to develop these genes to produce more melanin or pigment in their in their skin and eyes okay and so on so that's what alleles are now as i mentioned earlier um DNA, is, and when I say phenotype, I'm sorry, before I get into this next topic, when I say phenotype, what I'm saying is those are, the, when you, those are the physical characteristics of gene expression. So, for example, you know there's a gene for eye color, okay, and me, I have blue eyes, okay? So, basically, I, you know, how, do, how can you tell that I have, you know, a gene that codes for the blue eye color? You look at my eyes. You look at the physical characteristic of the organism. Okay, that's the phenotype. The you know the you know there's phenotype and there's what's called genotype. Okay, genotype would be when you're actually looking at the genome, the sequence DNA, or you're doing some basic Mendelian genetics and Punnett squares to um, figure out what genes and what characteristics people may have based on looking at their actual DNA itself, okay? So phenotype of the physical characteristics, genotype is the more molecular characteristics, okay? Now, as I mentioned earlier, DNA, you know, DNA is a code for protein synthesis, but what's interesting, though, is that 98% of all the DNA within us is what we call junk DNA, Okay, we call it junk DNA because it's non-coding. So realistically, only 2% of our DNA is actually used for making proteins. The rest, no one really knows what it does. You know, it's not well understood what junk DNA does. You know, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of people believe that junk DNA is regulatory. Okay, that it may, you know, regulate checks and balances within the cell cycle. Okay, but no one really knows what it does. You know, you know, as I mentioned, the main job of DNA is for is a code to synthesize proteins, but ninety eight percent of the DNA within us doesn't, you know, doesn't do that. You know, it's kind of interesting. 
Okay, and you know humans, you know the human genome consists of you know typically between you know depending on what book you read, thirty to thirty-five thousand different genes. I mean that goes to show how complex of an organism we actually are. All right, so that's I mean these are some basic uh, characteristics of DNA. Now let's take a look at the you know the the structure and composition of DNA. Okay, now DNA. Um, if we want to describe the, the, the physical appearance of DNA, we would call it the double helix. Okay, double helix stands for twisted ladder. Okay, so if I was to draw out a strand of DNA, okay, bear with my art here, people. Okay, DNA is a double stranded. molecule. Okay, DNA is a double-stranded molecule. All right. So, DNA being double-stranded. All right. Now, one thing about one thing about DNA is that it is a rather weakly formed molecule, all right? And you know, DNA is structured based off of what we call bases. Okay? These images here you see on the here and here these images came actually out of uh, uh, Kenneth Saladin's textbook, um, chapter four, you know, about uh, DNA and protein synthesis. So I just, I use these because I like these pictures, and this is the book we used to use for, cl uh, for the class before we made the switch. So, um, now, what basically, you know, as I mentioned in chapter two, these are what are called nucleic acids. Okay, these are nucleic acids, all right, and there are what are called purines and pyridamines, um, you know, realistically, I don't care that you really know the difference between these two because you're going to forget about them as we go, but um, you do have to understand something, you know, something called complementary, oops, base pairing. Okay, complementary base pairing. Okay, so basically there are, you know, so there are these four nucleotides that, that, that you find within the structure of a strand of DNA. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. Okay, uracil is found in RNA. Okay, and I'll talk more about that in a sec. Okay, so a little easier way to remember this, A, T, C, and G. All right, now. So there's only four, there's really only four molecules that make up the major backbone and structure of DNA. All right. Now, the different arrangements that you find these molecules are what are basically what genes are. All right. Now, when we're talking about the law of complementary base pairing, what we're saying here is that the, these bases pair up with each other in a certain fashion. All right. Now, what happens are adenine and thymine, these two chemically complement each other. These two can form chemical bonds and bond to one another. All right. Whereas cytosine and guanine, you know, chemically complement each other and bond together. Okay. A and C or A and G, that just does not happen. Okay, and the same thing with T and C and T and G. That does not happen. Okay, so if you if you come over here and take a look at this image, you'll notice that A and T form a, uh, a double covalent bond with one another, and G and C form a triple bond. Okay, they form a double covalent bond plus they form they have an extra hydrogen bond going on here. Okay, so think about this for a second. If a if a if a strand of DNA you know has Let's say you've got one strand of DNA that has a lot of C and G and another strand of DNA that has a lot of A and T. Which strand do you think would be harder to separate? Which, which strand do you think may be harder to break apart? Which one has more energy holding it together? Okay, you know, it's, it's this one. Okay, so, so, the C and, so wherever there's C and G, there's a little bit of a stronger bond. Okay, now bear in mind, whenever, now we call this a twisted ladder because the strands of DNA do kink and twist. All right, now remember that wherever you see these kinks and twists, that's a hydrogen bond. Okay, remember hydrogen bonds are bonds between either hydrogen and oxygen, hydrogen and nitrogen, and that gives 
molecule specific shapes okay and that's how DNA gets its specific shape all right so that's the law of complementary base pairing now this is important to understand because a little later you're going to learn about you know DNA replicating itself basically basically in a nutshell when DNA replicates itself there are enzymes that come in that separate the strands of DNA and then there's an enzyme called DNA polymerase that goes and reads okay that goes and reads this so let's say for example you've got an A you've got a T you've got a G and you've got a G okay so if I want to make a copy of this strand of DNA and this enzyme is going around laying down the complementary bases what's going to be on the other side what complements A well that'd be T what complements T that would be A alright what complements G that would be a C all right, so basically when we copy DNA, there's one part of the new copy has the, you know, the old, the parent DNA, and then you've got, you know, the other, the other side or the, 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 the newly laid strand has some, the newly copied side as well. All right, and we make, we make copies of our DNA basically for mitosis for nuclear division all right that's important because whenever we whenever we divide us whenever a cell divides okay it forms two genetic copies of itself all right and in order for that to happen we need to have all the dna copied in order for these two to be Id identical genetic copies for one another we need to have replicated all the dna from the from the mother cell all right so a and t c and g okay so you're going to have to remember that because in a little bit we're going to talk about a process called transcription and translation, the process of, you know, the beginning of making proteins. All right. So, in, I mean, in a nutshell, for what you guys need to know for the basics of A and P, I mean, that's what DNA is. It's a, it's a double-stranded molecule that consists of these four nucleotides, okay, or, nu you know, these nucleic acids, which we call nucleotides, and... Add, you know, A and T, adenine and thymine complement each other, C and G complement each other. All right. So let's talk about, whoa, Nelly. Hey. Got this image a little too far over here. Sorry about that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit now about the about proteins about how we use DNA for protein synthesis. All right. Now there are two major parts to protein synthesis: transcription and translation. Transcription and translation. All right. So or we could we we should call these actually not parts. We'll call these phases. Okay. The phases of protein synthesis. All right. Transcription occurs in the nucleus okay transcription occurs in the nucleus translation occurs out in the cytoplasm either on a ribosome that's bound to the rough endoplasmic reticulum or a ribosome that is free within the systole of the cell okay so keep that in mind now, in a nutshell, what you know, I'll talk more in depth about these in a second. What we're doing with transcription and translation is we're forming a template for creating a protein. Now, remember, a little while ago, I mentioned that DNA cannot leave the nucleus of the cell. All right, but the protein-making machinery, the ribosomes, are outside of the nucleus. All right, so as a result, there has to be some way. To get this to get this code to get this coded message from DNA out to here all right and that's what that's what transcription is all about okay it's basically creating a message messenger RNA to be sent to a ribosome within the you know outside of the nucleus of the cell and then what translation is translation is basically reading that message okay decoding or reading that that strand of messenger RNA so we can actually begin the formation of a protein itself so we're transcribing a message in the nucleus and then we're translating that message out in the cytoplasm of the cell all right so let's talk a little more specific to these um, let's talk a little more specifically to about these here so I'm gonna need to get a new slide up here sorry about that folks Okay, first, let's talk about transcription. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about transcription first. Okay, now remember, transcription occurs within the nucleus of the cell. Oops, occurs within the nucleus of the cell. All right, so basically what, what happens with transcription is it's a, you know, again, I'm giving you kind of the watered down version of this. But again, let's say this is a strand of DNA. Okay, because remember, DNA is double stranded. All right, so basically we can, we can break this down into three separate phases or three separate stages. Okay, we can say there is initiation. All right, then we can say that there is elongation. All right, and then we can say that there is termination. Okay, so these would be the three phases, all right, of, of transcription. So basically what happens when the, you know, whatever, whatever, the, you know, there are various ways that we can signal gene expression for the purpose of making a protein. You know, and again, this is a more of a complex cell biology topic, but there are a lot of factors that can influence gene expression in the synthesis of a protein. Okay, so we're going to just say that something is happening, okay, whether it was stimulation from a, you know, a steroid hormone, some environmental factor, whatever it may be, okay, we're just, we're going to not list all the different factors, but, you know, there are lots of different factors that could stimulate the expression of a gene, okay. Now, remember, when we're making a specific protein, we're not using the entire strand of DNA, we're only using a specific area of that DNA. Remember, that's what a gene is. It's a specific area. That's a specific code. Now, this area is what we're going to call the promoter region. Okay, the promoter region. Okay, so this promoter region, um, what's going to happen, there's an enzyme, you know, that's going to bind to this strand of DNA, and this enzyme is called RNA polymerase. Remember, whenever you see ASE at the end of a word, that represents an enzyme. All right. So essentially what, what RNA polymerase is going to do, let's say this is what the enzyme looks like. And let's say we've got our strand of DNA associated with this. So, ba so essentially what this enzyme is going to do is it's going to unwind the strand of DNA, okay? So what it's going to do is it's actually going to separate the chemical bonds that are in between each base pair, all right? It's going to separate the chemical bonds in between each base pair. And then what it's going to do is it's going to read the, it's going to, it's going to read, you know, the base strand here. So let's say, for example, we've got A, T, G, G, C, C, A, T. All right, and let's say off of this, this let's say off of this strand right here, we want to synthesize a a message, a strand of messenger RNA. Okay, now this is remember remember we mentioned uracil before. Now this is what's different about a strand of RNA. Okay, we said that you know we said that DNA. You know, we said that DNA is double-stranded. RNA is single-stranded. Okay. Another thing, another big difference, you know, DNA is much larger in size. RNA is much smaller in size. Okay, because, you know, remember, DNA is an entire strand. We're making a strand of RNA just off of a smaller segment of DNA. Okay, another thing is that DNA, you know, has T... RNA has U, uracil. Okay, so whenever, so you know that in a strand of DNA, you know, um, adenine and thymine complement one another, but when we're synthesizing a strand of messenger RNA, instead of a T, it's going to be a U, a uracil. Okay, and then let's work our way down and synthesize a strand of messenger RNA off this gene. Okay, so with T, there's going to be A. With G, there's going to be C. With C, there's going to be G. With A, with RNA, there's going to be U. And then we're at A. Now, this enzyme is going to continue to read down this gene. And eventually, it's going to run into a sequence. It's going to run into a sequence of base pairs 
that are going to basically terminate this process. They're going to stop the process. All right. And then once the, and then now basically as this RNA polymerase travels down, you know, on the front side, it's unwinding the strand of DNA. And on the, on the, on the back side, it is basically rewinding the strand of DNA. Okay. And once it reaches this, this term, this termination region of the gene, the stop region of the gene, then obviously we're going to stop making a strand of RNA. And then this messenger RNA is going to detach. All right. This messenger RNA is going to detach. And then now we have this single stranded uh, molecule that can now exit the nucleus. Okay. So that's basically initiation, elongation, and termination. You know, we initiate RNA synthesis on a promoter region of a strand of DNA. And then during elongation, this enzyme RNA polymerase unwinds and rewinds DNA. And as it's doing this, it is laying down complements, you know, based on whatever, based on whatever the message is within that strand of DNA and forming a specific messenger RNA molecule. Okay, so then as a result, that messenger RNA then is going, you know, then what then we'll reach this, then we'll eventually reach a termination region within that gene, and then we'll stop synthesizing the messenger RNA. It'll separate, and then now we've got this single stranded message that is now small enough to fit through the nuclear pores and get out to the protein making machinery of the cell itself. Okay, so that's transcription. Making messenger RNA. Okay, making messenger RNA so we can use it to create a protein. All right, now next, what you're going to see is the process of transcription. Okay, and with transcription, I'm sorry, transcript, translation, ah, transcription, translation, sorry, it's been a long week. Okay, transcription translation. So now we've synthesized this message. We synthesized a strand of RNA. Okay, so remember, you've got your nucleus. DNA is not going anywhere, but messenger RNA is. Okay, and that messenger RNA is then going to exit out the, the nuclear pores out to the ribosomes. Okay. So basically, when you look at a ribosome, ribosomes are, you know, essentially double unit structures, okay? So they're these basically, all right, and what you're, what you're going to have here then is that messenger RNA is going to, that messenger RNA is then going to associate itself or attach to the ribosome. And again, this could be on a ribosome that is attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum or a ribosome that's a, the, a free ribosome within the systole of the cell. Okay, so basically what we're going to have happen here is there's another strand of RNA called transfer RNA. Okay, so basically what this strand of messenger RNA is it's half of the end product, okay? It's half of the end product. So what transfer RNA is doing is it's transferring the other half of this so we can form uh, an amino acid itself. So remember that this is single-stranded. All right, it's single-stranded. Now, when you take a now when you take a look at this this messenger RNA that's associated with the ribosome. What you're going to notice is that when we make a when we make an amino acid, we're reading we're reading these base pairs in triplets. Okay, so basically every three every three of these bases that's what we call a codon. You know, codon code. All right. Now, what when you're taking a look at transfer RNA, it's going to look again. You really have to forgive my art on this. It's going to look something. Like so, and then, okay, so now we have this. Now you'll notice that there are also, that there's a, that there's, 
these three bases down here, and this is what we call an anti codon. So essentially what this tRNA molecule is going to do is it's going to come in, and again, please forgive my art here, and the anti codon region is going to join up with the codon, okay? And then basically on the upper aspect here, we have an incomplete amino acid, but now once we link these two together, now we form a finished amino acid, okay? So basically we have half of an amino acid on a strand of messenger RNA. We've got a half of a, we got half of an amino acid on a, on a transfer RNA, when the two come together, we now have an amino acid, okay? And again, you can find these, you know, these, these codes, you know, whether it's A, or not, you know, whether it's A, C, C, I mean, it could, it could be many different arrangements of these, all right? And like I said, you know, so if this is A, what's this going to be? And, and this anti-codon region, this would be U, G, G. So then that's going to go bang, come down, we have a finished amino acid. So then what's going to happen next is this messenger RNA then is going to shift, and then this strand is going to, is going to shift, and then a, a new tRNA is going to come in. Okay, now I'm really just getting lax with my art here, but then another tRNA is going to come in. You know, it's going to bind with the next codon region of the messenger RNA, and now you have another protein. Okay, so then, so basically, when this new one came in, the old one went. Okay, and this is just going to continue to happen. And every time this happens, we're gonna we're gonna break, we're gonna burn an ATP molecule to basically, you know, detach the transfer RNA to shift the messenger RNA over so another tRNA can come on. And then we'll form these peptide bonds and form this linear chain of amino acids. Remember, we call that the primary structure of a protein. All right. And like I said, you know, this is going to happen up to, on average, you know, 25 to 50,000 times. So 25 to 50,000 tRNAs are going to meet up with messenger RNA to form this primary structure. Now, basically, as we're continuously reading and shifting down, okay, this uh, strand of messenger RNA, we will continue to form this linear chain of amino acids. And as this chain grows longer, remember that we form hydrogen bonds, all right? And then you're going to start to see the amino acids start to bond with each other, form bends and twists and coils, and that's when we start to form the secondary structure of a protein, those, those helix-like structures, all right? And then what's going to happen, all right, So then they're going to start to kind of bend and twist to contort and form kind of a helix-like structure. And then once this 50,000 chain amino acid is, is, is released, okay, because what's going to happen, this is going to continue until we reach what's called a stop codon. Okay, that's just a signal that stops this entire process and then this detaches, all right. And then what will happen are once this detaches, then the, then the hydrogen bonding just continues. And then, the, and then the twisting and the coiling becomes more pronounced and the, the proteins conform to each other more, or, you know, the amino acids conform to each other more tightly. And then you form the tertiary structure of a protein. Okay. And then remember from here, so let's say you've got your cell, you've got your nucleus, you got your rough ER, okay, and then ribosomes. So let's say we're making a protein right here, all right, so then all of a sudden this contorted glob protein will eventually work its way to the Golgi. And then remember that this protein is going to be modified. Will the Golgi will conjugate it with a carbohydrate or a fat, okay, or it'll, can, or it'll, allow it, or it'll aid it in the continuing of the, the formation of the shape. And then the Golgi is going to package this protein, and then that protein is going to be exported out of the cell. Because remember, when, when this process occurs on ribosomes on the rough ER, those proteins are exported out. Okay, when that happens on free ribosomes in the systole, those proteins usually remain within the cell. 
all right, for the cell to use itself. Okay, and that's the process of translation, just reading the message on a strand of messenger RNA. All right, so if we go back and we come back to this image here, you can see how that happens. So, so again, you can see the strand of messenger RNA working its way through the ribosome, and every time, you know, a tRNA meets up with a codon region, will form one amino acid. That's what one of these little beads are, is one amino acid. And then this is just going to continue and continue and continue until a stop codon is reached. Okay. And that, in a, in a very, very, very basic nutshell, is how we make proteins. Again, transcription, translation, the two phases of protein synthesis. We, tra we transcribe a message within the nucleus, and then we send that message out the nucleus to a ribosome where transfer RNA meets up and completes the process of making a protein. All right, I know, you know, this is going to be, this may be a little confusing to some people. I understand it was a lot kind of quickly, but, you know, again, if you have questions, you know, please don't hesitate to ask. And, well, next what I want to focus on before I stop this is next I want to talk about, um, I'm going to move into the cell cycle and mitosis. And, you know, I'll talk a little bit about DNA replication, but not much. But remember that, you know, when a cell is normally functioning, that's what it's doing. It's just constantly unwinding and winding DNA, making messages to synthesize proteins. Now, this is important to understand because eventually at some point in time, a cell is going to reproduce and, you know, there's a lot that revolves around DNA and cellular reproduction, mitosis as well.